Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namaste So this chapter 9 begins a long uh, description of the worship of Shiva and how it is accomplished, how is it done with different mantras, how are the different articles of worship offered, how are the temples built, how are the idols installed, and so on and so on and so on. Everything you need to know, except for one thing, the detailed texts of the mantras. And that's because the mantras are usually passed down from guru to disciple directly through the means of initiation. And the first initiation is described here in chapter 9. Brahma and Vishnu, after uh, being instructed by Shiva that, hey, guess what, neither of you is the supreme. <laughs> surprise, surprise they were initiated into the mantra Aumkar, the Pranava. Pranava means the source of life, prana, life energy. So this mantra Aum has three transcendental letters and it's described very nicely in the text. Now, if you haven't watched chapter nine, do it now because we're going to be referring to a context that you're not familiar with, and so it's going to be hard to understand what we're talking about. So anyway, go ahead and take a look at that now if you haven't already. So what happens? After Brahma and Vishnu are saved, really blessed by Shiva and rewarded in different ways, they begin to worship him. And it's described that they worship him like a king. They offer him all kinds of auspicious paraphernalia. And this is described in great detail. This is the origin of temple worship. Temple worship is a metaphor that Shiva is the king of all gods. Deva Deva, the god of gods. Deva Raja, the king of gods. These are some of his thousand names. And therefore, he is to be worshipped with royal paraphernalia, just like a king, or even better than a king in this world. Because with a king, everyone is afraid. Huh? If I don't worship him, maybe he kills me or he messes me up or something. But with Shiva, we don't have to be afraid because he is our dear most self. He is our inmost consciousness. He is really our life, our all, our everything. So we don't need to be afraid of him unless we offend him. Then it's like head for the hills, but even that won't save you. So better to adopt a friendly, loving attitude towards Shiva and offer him the things that he really deserves because he has created everything, including our very self. So after this royal worship, Shiva describes the Shivaratri festival. The Shivaratri is usually uh, during the winter time, depends on the astrology exactly when it is. It doesn't fall on the same date in the Western calendar uh, every year because it's calculated by nakshatras. So in order to understand the nakshatras, you have to do a little research and look up the date for Shivaratri in this year on the internet. Okay, this year, next year, any year. It's always going to be different in the Western calendar. So that date is extremely auspicious and should be celebrated with every opulence imaginable. Uh, everything within your means, anyway, that you can offer to Shiva 
and do in his worship is highly recommended because it gives thousands and millions of times better results than normal. He says, worshiping me on Shivaratri day is like doing that worship for a whole year. So do the best worship that you can on Shivaratri day. Now, the next point is the initiation into Aum. So Shiva explains the mantra Aum, consisting of three transcendental letters, A, U, and N, the nasal M, plus the Bindu and Nada. The Bindu is the dot that you see on top of the Aum symbol. And the nada is the curved line underneath it. In Western music, it's called a firmata, and the whole thing is turned upside down. And it means a note that's held out for an indefinite length of time. So in the same way, the nada, the transcendental sound vibration, is held indefinitely, actually for the duration of the cosmos, the creation. And the bindu, is tiny silence. It's an infinitesimal dimensionless point of nothingness. So a word about Aum, although we've already explained this several times before, each of the three letters, A, U, and N, is long. It has a macron or a line over the letter. And if you look at the Aum symbol, you'll see that it's the letter A and U combined. The long A and the long U plus the N. So altogether, they take up three complete matras or beats. One matra is equal to two padas. And a pada is the uh, sub-beat, like an eighth note. So it's a u uh, and the dot, the bindu, is a half a beat of silence. One pada of silence. And the nada means that the final nasal M is held out for a long time. So when chanting this mantra, this pranava, omkar, it should be chanted long. Aum. Silence. Before the next chant, or if it's part of another mantra, before the next mantra. So this is the secret of chanting Aum successfully. And it's why we always pronounce it Aum, not Om. <laughs> That's a different mantra. It has a different meaning. It has a far uh, less of an effect. So, as usual, when a yoga teachings came to the West, Aum was perverted into Om. <laughs> Duh. But that's not the actual mantra, and it will not give the complete result. It will give something, but not as much as the original. So then, the origin of Arunachala is revealed. Arunachala Hill in Tiruvannamalai, South India, Tamil Nadu, is described here as the greatest holy place. Why? Because the unlimited phallic uh, pillar of fire that Shiva manifested <laughs> to quell the pride of uh, Vishnu and Brahma was reduced in size so that it would like fit on a planet <laughs> and made into a non-fiery place. So this is Arunachala Hill. It used to be very large. Now, due to the influence of time, it has worn down and it's comparatively small. But the rocks in Arunachala Hill have been dated by geologists to be billions of years older than the surrounding material in the earth crust. So there's actually something very special about this hill. 
And not only that, there are magnetic and gravitational anomalies associated with it, only recently measured by satellites. So our Nachula is really special. Any service or any meditation or any chanting or anything done there is millions of times more powerful than anywhere else. So, residing in Arunachala, I was there for five years. That was pretty good. That was good enough. <laughs> Gives access to Shiva's region and liberation. And it also grants all desires, other desires. So, uh, one should definitely visit and, if possible, remain at Arunachala, worship Arunachala, because this is the cosmic phallus. This is the pillar of fire, the unlimited column of fire that was immeasurable and inconceivable even to Brahma and Vishnu. So uh, this is his gift to mankind. And Ramana Maharshi, of course, regards it as the center of the world. Everything is to be measured according to uh, Tiruvannamala or Arunachala. And I used to live right across the street from the temple that commemorates this event. And the temple is called Agni Lingam, fire penis. <laughs> so this is the origin of the Shiva Lingam. This is how the Shiva Lingam came to be worshipped as Shiva's symbol. And finally, at the end of the chapter, Shiva explains why he is the supreme because he has the being the nature of brahman therefore he is worshipped in the phallic form the shivalingam other gods are not worshipped in phallic form lingams no you don't see this with any other god only the personal form is worshipped that's because they're jivas. They are individual conditioned souls. We mentioned this before, that Brahma and Vishnu, because they're involved with the creation and maintenance of the universe, respectively, have to believe that the universe is real. They have to care about it. They have to act on behalf of the existence of the universe. They have to do many things related to the creation and maintenance of the universe that they could not do if they regarded it as illusory. So really, the uh, associates and the devotees of Shiva are on a higher level of realization, a higher level of consciousness than even Brahma and Vishnu. So this is the great secret of Brahman referred to by Nandi Keshwara right in the beginning of this section, which began with, I think, chapter 7. So, this is the secret of Shiva. He is Brahman. He is the Absolute. He is the source of everything. He is Absolute Reality. He is real being. He is the actual Supreme God the Supreme Lord. So, therefore, one should worship Shiva alone. And if you try it, you will find that worship of Shiva gives immediate results. By immediate, I mean instantaneous. <laughs> There's a saying that worship of other gods gives results after some time, after the worship is performed and maintained for some time. But worship of Shiva gives results the next moment. Now, it may take you some time to notice them or to understand them because they can be quite subtle. But it's a fact that simply chanting Shiva's name, Om Namah Shivaya, or any of the mantras connected with Shiva, or making any offering at any Shiva temple, or what to speak of installing Shiva Lingam and worshiping him in that form, the formless form, according to the instructions in the scriptures, gives unparalleled and immediate 
transcendental realization. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>